Hello guys, welcome to my studio. This is really an unusual situation, but let's make the best of it. I want to pick up where we left off. Remember in our workshop, which was entitled Inventing Abstraction. Okay, good. I want to review just a little bit of what we were talking about because it's abstraction really is what we're after. We know that abstraction wasn't invented in a day. It took a long time. It took a lot of different elements put together to combine and to program people's heads to make them ready to accept abstract art. And there were different ingredients, okay? Remember, we've talked about this. And one of them, of course, was primitivism. One bright side of this strange situation is that I can actually show you uh, these two pieces that are in my studio, which explain perfectly the fascinating aspects of primitive art. Okay, now primitivism was, or let me define that a little better, primitive art, meaning uh, art from cultures that are very un-Western. So actually the young radical artists of this period of time, and we're talking about 1900, okay? So in that period of time, the young radical artists, they were looking for something much more. They were looking at something that was breaking the rules, okay? This is something you always want to keep in mind when you're studying modern art. It's all about breaking the rules. But breaking the rules of who? Okay, that's the big question. Well, it was the Academy. The Academy was the Fort Knox of Western tradition. And that they were telling artists exactly what to paint, how to paint, when to paint, and all of the rules and regulations that have been set for hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay, so you'll probably recognize these works from especially the German expressionists. This is the group called De Brucke. And De Brucke, you can see how fascinated they were with the African mask. And one aspect in particular, well, not just the Germans, but of course we also have Modigliani. And then there's also Pablo Picasso. It's so clear what they were looking at. They were looking at the African mask. Why? Well, it's about synthesis. Synthesis is what they were after. These young artists, they were looking for something very dramatic, something that took them away from tradition, something that was breaking the rules. Okay, and what they were breaking was one of the most important rules of all, which was realism. So De Brucke, uh, Modigliani, Matisse, Picasso, they were fascinated by this primitive synthesis. The way that you can just free yourself up from realism and begin to explore various possibilities by way of geometry, by way of a free line, where no rules, or very few, were going to bother you. Okay, so we have two ingredients so far. Uh, primitivism, expressionism, and now let's move back to Paris. So we're around 19, let's say 1905, which pretty much corresponds with the year that Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque met. Now, Paul Cezanne, he was after something else, but even way before these young artists began to break away from tradition, Paul Cezanne was doing it even 20 years before, and it's what's called analysis. He had this theory, 
even back in the 80s and the 70s, that all of nature should be reduced into a triangle, a square, and a circle. And this was something that Pablo Picasso, in particular, really took home, okay? And a good friend of his, Georges Braque, they both began to work together and applying the philosophy of everything that they see should be filtered through these very fundamental geometric forms. And this is called analysis. If the German expressionists, they were breaking the golden rule of realism through synthesis, Pablo Picasso and George Brock, more or less around 1905, began to break the golden rules of the illusion of space and perspective. These were incredibly important rules at the Academy. And this is exactly what Paul Cezanne was doing. He was breaking those rules, basically by first considering the four sides of his painting as a cube. And everything that goes inside the cube should in some way work with it. For example, if he did a bottle, he could put it here. The table could go right through it. A plate down below in transparency goes through it. And all of the forms that might make a room begin to break up the rectangle. And what happens? You begin to lose the illusion of space. You begin to lose perspective. And you begin to pay attention to the painting itself. Pablo Picasso and George Brock, very good friends, began to work together, work together so intensely that almost, almost you couldn't even tell their work apart. So here we are, we're in about 1908 now, to about 1911. They were working day and night in their studios. Still lifes, one of the most uh, consolidated subject in classical art, suddenly is becoming broken up, shattered, analyzed in all of its forms, so that they could even see objects from different points of view all at the same time. So, synthetic cubism. That is one of the most exciting things that was happening on the modern art scene at this time. In fact, it was getting a lot of attention because look what's happening. We have actual objects. So our paintings are figurative. They are not abstract, but we're losing almost. We're at the very brink of abstraction. We are almost there, but not quite. You can still see fragments of a violin cards and books and bottles on a table. So they didn't open the door of abstraction, but they came up and they knocked on it. In fact, when Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso showed their work, more or less around 1910, it drew a lot of attention. And most of the attention was given by new and young artists that loved the idea of synthetic cubism. In fact, from all parts of Europe, we have artists, for example, from Spain, we have Juan Gris, who even did cubism better than Picasso, I could say. Even Carra, Ferdinand Leger, Robert Delaunay. Everyone was jumping on the train of synthetic cubism because it was a way to get to a very dynamic and a very personal form of figurative painting. Okay, so here we are with Pablo Picasso's and George Brock's analytical cubism. Let's do a project. This is what I have in mind. So also take a look at the notes that I sent you and you can see what I'm talking about. But to do our project, you're going to need one of these two pencils. This is just an ordinary HB pencil. <laughs> this one, whereas this I would never drop because it is precious and it is a 5B pencil. Now, to do an analytical cubist drawing, first there's a technique to it. And this is something that 
Picasso and Brock, but also all of the other ones that we talked about. Everything from Leger to, to Delaunay, they were all shading, okay? And shading is basically when you're starting with dark and then as you keep going, you lighten it up, you lighten it up, you lighten it up, you lighten it up. Okay, so it goes from dark to light, and this gives you a little illusion of space. Okay, now we can try crossing it again from this direction. From dark to light to lighter to lighter. Okay, and then we can even go this way. From dark to light. And then this way. This is just, I'm warming up, you guys. So you see that even by doing this, we're creating little micro illusions of space. It looks like they're pieces of paper that are overlapping each other, okay? And this is what it's all about because what they're doing is that they're breaking the rules of traditional perspective. Okay, now to start it, refer to the photograph that I gave you in the notes, or maybe I give them to you in class. But in any case, you can copy that off or just call it up on your computer and copy from there. Or you can even invent your own still life in your house. But in any case, what you want to do, remember that cubism begins with the rectangle of the drawing itself. That's your cube number one. So everything that you draw in here needs to be subservient to the rectangle, which means everything needs to fit nicely within this rectangle. You don't forget about parts. So if you look closely, it doesn't take a lot of uh, perfection, okay? Uh, our bottle, for example, remember that everything is going to be very transparent. And the wonderful thing about cubism is that you're looking at one object, even if it's a little bit wobbly, from different perspectives, okay? And you can even add your own. I mean, what Pablo really liked about his bottles is that, well, besides the contents, but also the fact that you can see not only the bottom of the bottle, the contents of the bottle, but also the top, all at the same time. And then our lemon, for example. Our cup is to the side. And notice how all of these lines are overlapping. Lemon number one, lemon number two, lemon number three, and then a round plate. And then the rectangle below. Then there's a vase of flowers. Again, we're looking at it from different perspectives. So it doesn't matter if these lines begin to intercept each other. And if you look closely, you can start to see some of those details. Then we have curtains falling behind. And that's what I mean. Don't forget about those empty spaces in our rectangle. There needs to be some sort of attention given to that because everything needs to be compact and organized within our rectangle. Okay, so once you get these overlapping lines, this is the fun part. This is where the analysis begins. So as you go from space to space, Every single one needs to be analyzed, and you do it by shading. So here I'm going to go from dark to light, but in this one, maybe I'm going to go from dark to light in the other direction. That is not logical, but it looks good. Here's dark to light this way, then dark to light this way, dark to light this way. I'm not thinking about logic. I'm not thinking about if it looks realistic. And by doing this, I'm breaking up all of the logical space and I'm making it like a shattered piece of glass. And pretty soon, 
my traditional subject, if I keep it up, is going to dissolve. It's going to become like those. So once you keep adding on, adding on, remember, don't forget and leave out big, wide, empty spaces. Make sure that you're sort of balancing things out because that's a real key thing to, to cubism is that all of the angles have been considered. Now, once you feel like, okay, yeah, this is a good composition, it captures the essence of my bottle and lemons and vase of flowers, but at the same time, it's pushing the subject to the maximum. If I look at it quickly or from afar, it almost looks abstract, but it's not. It's still figurative. And this is the beautiful thing about, about analytical cubism of Picasso and Brock. They pushed the subject to the limit until it almost wasn't there anymore. It was replaced by dynamic shapes. Okay, and now once you finish it, don't just abandon it. Find a nice piece of paper that you can mount it on, okay? And remember to include this into your um, portfolio that we're making in class. Okay, so this is pretty much the end of part one of our inventing abstraction. Remember, let's just go back over this very quickly. We have ingredients like primitivism, expressionism, and finally, analytical cubism. Those are things that pushed our subject, which was the most sacred of all rules of the academy, to be realistic. And these three elements push that realism into almost, almost, almost the world of abstraction, but not quite. And that's what we're going to talk about next time. Who went into the world of abstraction and opened the doors for a whole new language in modern art? Okay, so we'll see you next time. <laughs>